opening this up slideshow can we give me a little head nod how are you seeing what i'm seeing here beautiful okay same face so my name is sam cree I already read my thing so i don't need to introduce myself here's our 20 i don't know why i thought it was 25 minutes long but let's just bam 25 minutes and then we'll be five minutes early we're gonna reflect on our experiences with self-care I'm going to summarize a couple of things from scholarship of teaching and learning on self care. I'm going to connect that to some pop culture um, literature on self care on, that I've been reading, binge reading. And then we're going to end with some practical takeaways about what all of that means. So that's the game plan. Um, and here is my objective or kind of my take home point for the day, which is that we can't fill other people's cups if we don't have anything in our own cup, right? And so um, I've heard some really cool things throughout this conference, even the keynote, which I admittedly only made half of because my self-care made me get up and walk. It was long, 90 minutes was a long time to be there, even though it was really great. And so, but a lot of those things are, right, how can we care for our students? How can we take better care of our students? Um, and so this, presentation will flip that mirror around and say, how can we take care of ourselves so that we are capable then of taking care of our students in the way that they deserve and the way that we deserve. So before I get too far off talking about self care, I want to recognize, um, I don't have a good definition of self care, but I want to recognize this little quote here. Um, from one of the articles I'll be chatting about, which is that, quote, academic work is often predicated on a separation between the individual self and the professional self, end quote. Um, and so I just want to start by saying I'm going to talk a lot about self-care in kind of a vague way. And I think, and people, when I'm searching, when I was searching for it for the lit review, searching for academic self-care or professional self-care, but um, at least how I'm going to talk about it now and how I interpret self-care is that they are one in the same, right? There's kind of this artificial separation that we are our work selves and our professional, right, our social selves, and they're kind of these different selves. Um, and I don't think that's not that that's not the interpretation that I'll be working with throughout this presentation. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so we'll start by just reflecting on our self-care and how we've learned about academic self-care. And we'll do that with a poll everywhere. Woo! Get some energy, folks. We're going, we're going hard, 4 p.m. Get the second, the second rush. So uh, here is this, here's this thing that I'm doing where I'm asking you what words you most associate with the term self-care. Um, I could type this in the chat so that you could just click on it if I can find the chat. So here's the one we'll do, polev.com slash Samantha Clem 828. And I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed that that's real, not that it's gonna do something. Yes, thanks, Sean. So there'll be a couple in quick succession. We'll just do a couple of these holes, just get our fingers moving. So what kind of words do we associate? I say self-care and you've got something in your head and I want to know what it is. Is it a word? Is it a place? Is it a person? Um, and then if you haven't done whole everywheres before, this is the word cloud feature. And it's one of my favorite features because it moves and it looks nice and it's colorful and it's probably miserable on a screen reader. And I'm just thinking about that now, but that's okay. So we've got a bunch of words up here, relaxation, rejuvenation, time, priorities, mindfulness, expensive, health, selfish, baths. Um, Bubble, I imagine that came. Candle lit, hello. Um, hiking. Okay, so these are some of these, these ideas that we get when we think about self-care. I'm going to move on to the next one. So keep these words in mind as we go on thinking about life. And I'm going to lock that. 
and go to my next slide. So now who or what has had a positive impact on your self-care? So if we're thinking about bubble baths, <laughs> y'all are already in my thing. You cannot earn brownie points right now. <laughs> um, so who or what, what are kind of these influences? Who are these people or things um, that are really affecting our, our self-care? So we've got therapy, same colleagues, lit circles, yoga, podcasts, supervisors, dogs, so pets, lots of animals in there. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to lock those. Bam, your partners, the gym, bed. Yes, where, where's Hannah? She's coming at us from bed. So we absolutely will accept bed. Okay, now let's let's flip that. And this is the last one. This is the last poll. What about negative impacts on your self-care? Who or what is negatively impacting your self-care? Cell phones, social media, work, evaluations, myself, me, background. Kids, screens, politics, some words coming up here, preconceptions, tenure, multitasking. All right, so I'm going to lock that. Thanks, everyone, for sharing those things with me, with us. Netflix, dates. Um, so here we've got a picture of my state of mind at the end of last spring. For those of you who are around me, I, I was feeling really burnt out and it felt like everyone I talked to, and that was probably because I was burnt out. So I was like looking, you know, like that thing where you bias your own interactions with people because of how you feel. I'm sure that was happening because I felt like everywhere I went, everyone was, it just felt burnt. Everything felt burnt and exhausted. And I am very lucky, lucky to be in a department where I think if you don't know anyone in the English department, you should because we're really cool and people are, um, people are talking about self-care. And so there's this idea like, ah, self-care, like, have you been self-caring? And I was like, ah, I don't know. Um, and so this is, I, if you haven't seen this meme, this is like me. If I were a meme, it is this image of, um, a person sitting at a desk with a note taped to their back that says, please don't talk to me. I have no self-control and we'll talk for you, talk to you for two hours and get no work done. And so my response like to all of this burnt out was just like, I hope that people just stop asking me to do things because I have no self-control and will inevitably do things. Um, and you can imagine about how well that was working from the previous image of my emotional state at the end of the semester. Um, and especially for, for folks who do things with social justice, a lot of my research is about social justice and there's this feeling like we have to do the work now and you can't, right? There is a certain level. And as a graduate student, especially, maybe not especially, some of you who are working on tenure and that was on your negative list, um, there is this perception, right, that if it's if no pain, no gain. If it's not hurting, you're not doing it right. If you're really comfortable, you're probably not doing enough work. Um, and so this is all where I was at at the end of last semester. And I've taught for many years. So I, I thought, what, what? I can't do this anymore. This is not sustainable. Um, and when I was most questioning was as a graduate student and as an instructor myself and involved in ETE, I thought to myself, why are people, why are we not talking about this more? And why am I not getting more support for how specifically and intentionally to take better care of myself and to be, um, so why, so self-care was getting talked about a lot, but it felt like it was very vague and that there wasn't a lot of concrete actions behind it or concrete um, 
tangibles, if that makes sense, behind what people were talking about. And like I said, I think I'm um, extremely fortunate to be somewhere where people are at least talking somehow about self-care. And so that's what led me to, um, to this, to this topic and to decide to take a break from all the other things I was doing and think about and learn about self-care because I was not able, I was ready to quit. I was ready to stop. So that brings us to number two, which is summarizing some scholarship of teaching and learning on self-care. Um, so here's just a few observations. The first of which is that there is very little about self-care that's getting published. Um, it was extremely difficult for me to find information and I had to bring in the librarians. Are there any librarians in the house? I had to go to my librarians who are experts and even with their help, it was very difficult. Um, I found very few, very, very few research related to self-care. And a lot of this research that's out there was related to how to care for our students, kind of like the pedagogies of care that I've seen in a lot of these presentations, right? How can we help our students? What kind of things can we do for our students so that they can learn how to care for themselves? Um, and not a lot related to the instructors. And I'm glad that Sean's here because the field of social work is an exception. So teach me humbly your ways um, because there seem to be, y'all have some things figured out about how we need to take care of people or else they will just not do it anymore, right? Um, and so, so, the, so social work, I mean, Sean, you can just skip the rest of this because you know I am sure. Um, <laughs> but so that is an, another caveat. And then the last caveat is, as there is very little information, there was, I was very surprised that very little of it, not, almost none of it related to intersectional identities, um, which I would personally think has a huge influence on who um, is feeling burnt out and who um, might be in more need and then in different kinds of self-care. So that's not gonna get, I'm not gonna talk about that here. Um, and that's partly because that wasn't a lot what I found, but I think it's worth mentioning. So this first article um, was really interesting. It was called Something Has to Change. And what happened is two academics found themselves as early career academics. And these were their experiences on the left side of the screen. They felt a sense of profound bewilderment, exhaustion, self-doubt, loneliness, feeling overwhelmed, depleted, and drained. That was their experience after three to four years as early career instructors. And they compared that to the World Health Organization's definition of well being, which includes I felt cheerful and good spirits. I felt calm and relaxed. I felt active and vigorous. I woke up feeling fresh and rested. And my daily life has been filled with things that interest me. So I would ask you to take a moment looking at those, what that definition of well-being and, and question how often at the end of a work day as an instructor, those are the things you're feeling. Are you feeling cheerful and active and refreshed and rested? Um, and if not, how can we work towards a better well-being within our community, our academic community? Um, and so it was, this study was interesting because what these women did was they wrote vignettes to each other, just describing their, their experience and then they coded their vignettes. And so I write results here because it was more, they coded this, I think they would argue with these being results. Um, but they mentioned acts of self-care, um, like going through this process of writing the vignettes to each other, and then also walking, taking walks, taking time to read, kind of some of these things that we, saw in your own reflections of what is positive influence. Um, and then also a humble acceptance of that this is just the state of reality, right? Some kind of acceptance of the current state also helped them an acceptance that they were not alone in feeling not well cared for um, by themselves and by their institutions. And so I, one of the things they mention is this idea of institutions having some remedies to burnout. For example, offering counseling service. I've seen CAPS have some things. Um, I don't know, y'all are maybe in um, tenure track or not as a graduate instructor, there are more things offered to you all than there are um, to students, or I don't know how that works. But 
they, they, they add this caveat, quote, however, it's argued that rather than encouraging self-care, offering these remedies like workplace relaxation or counseling or spirituality services amounts to making the individuals responsible for their own well-being, implying that those who are in a poor state of well-being are deficient in their use of such remedies. Um, and so they actually critique this idea that the institution should be providing solely these kind of remedies, these fixes um, to what would be the symptoms rather than addressing the causes. And here's another, so I only, I'm gonna only chat quickly about three. This is this one, a call to action. Um, and they identify four factors that promote, both promote and or hinder well-being, which are colleagues, managers, institutions, and workplaces, which were some of the topics that y'all put in our fluffy cloud. Um, and they also offer three suggestions for positively coping with stress, anxiety, and burnout, which are activities like exercise, sleep, diet, social connection, so informal activities and walking meetings, um, and then self-care and health-seeking strategies, which would include things like paid time off, practicing gratitude and spirituality. So I don't think any of this feels um, super surprising, perhaps. Um, they, in the one, you know, like when you double underline the thing and you start in the margin, that was this. And they wrote, quote, others acknowledge that the institution also had a role in managing challenges related to employee workload. Institutions need to take a good hard look at everything that everyone does and stop doing about 30% of it because it's not worth doing. <laughs> yes, and so I said, absolutely, let's cut 30% of everything we're doing right away. Um, send that to President Cockett, right? Um, and then in this last one that I'll mention, it was really, I am a weeper it, just by nature. So this was a weepy one. So trigger warning on that. This um, article argues that it takes this whole neoliberal idea that everything has become a marketplace. And so even when employers are offering things like counseling services, it's really just to help productivity of their employees, which in this case are instructors, um, which is why there's this tendency to over-individualize, right? And make it, oh, if you're having self-care problems, that's because you're not taking care of yourself. Um, and so they argue that we really have to open the conversation about depression, suicide, and well-being um, in an embodied way. So thinking about the bodies that are involved and, um, and they do it by pulling blogs and pulling articles of um, instructors that have committed suicide over the last 10 years. And so you can imagine it is a very powerful article um, that really brings to the forefront the need to discuss these topics more openly. Um, and another quote, I love quotes. So um, as scholars, our collective over-reliance on intellectualization may shield us from confronting the emotional pains experienced by us and our colleagues. However, much of our suffering, your faces are in the way, may be explained by a political context and discourses. We cannot step aside, we cannot sidestep the lived experiences of these macro processes felt at the level of the body. So Highly recommend if you're into um, embodied work. That was a good one, but very weepy. So my sense of this year quickly about the state of SOTL on self-care is that it's lacking, but if there is a position we're at right now, it's recognizing the experiences of instructors and we needing to force a conversation or a dialogue on this topic. A need to shift from negative to positive framing. Um, and so previous work, what on in Sotol said like don't do this don't do this and so there's um also a push to say like what is the positive where can we where do we want to be rather than where do we not want to be um and then also recognizing both individuals and systems in this plight for self-care and so that took me head first into poplet on self-care and when i thought about boundaries this is an image that i think about, right, like a boundary, um, this thing that you don't cross. And boundary was the word that quickly came up in all of my pop, in my self-help work reading, um, is the idea of boundaries. And 
one of these, I'll, this person, Nedra Tawab, I put her Instagram at the end because she wrote really, this was, if you read one thing, it would be this book. And it was really cool. Um, and signs that you need boundaries, feeling overwhelmed, feeling resentment, avoiding phone calls, making comments about helping people and not receiving anything in return, feeling burned out, frequently daydreaming or about dropping everything and disappearing, having no time for yourself, um, which fairly well described how I felt around May um, of just feeling overdrawn, like I was giving more of myself than I was getting in return. And, and they identify six types of boundaries. And what this was useful for me is that I hadn't, when I had thought about self-help, I was thinking about baths. I was thinking about doing yoga. I was thinking about all of these add-on activities, which in my state of mind in May was I cannot do anything else. I have no more time. So don't tell me to keep, and it almost was like a guilt provoking experience because then I knew that I should be doing things for self-care and self-help, but I didn't feel like I had the time and it felt like an extra thing I had to squeeze in. Um, and so this idea of boundaries and time boundaries in particular for me um, was really a powerful one. And so I went kind of through this journey of reading from this idea of boundaries as these set things um, to this image, which one of the books discusses as boundaries as like the shoreline or the coast, um, where you constantly have the water pushing up against you and nudging you, but the land just stays there. Um, the land simply is, it stands there, just sitting there. And so you're dealing with these daily forces. So rather than a fence that's not allowing anything, it's this rigid thing. It's more of this idea of a, of a boundary as land that a force tries every day to saturate you, um, but you're still there. And she describes it as natural boundaries. So the idea that no matter what we're doing, we already have boundaries in place. We are the land, the land is already there. So if you've ever gotten sick in the middle of being overstressed um, and overexerting yourself, this is a natural boundary, right? It's your body saying, this is too much. I will not do any more. Um, and so her whole point is that we're already doing a lot. We already have boundaries in place. We are the land. Um, and so the idea is just connecting with that boundary, those boundaries that are already there. Um, so she sets out this acronym, the land. So love, authority, negotiation, and direction, which I will kind of skim through just because we're short on time. But this whole idea of boundaries comes down to this idea of recognizing our own involvement and our own agency. Um, so me continuing to say yes to things, um, me continuing to be on committees, all of those actions, continuing to study, continuing to accept instructor roles, I do have agency in those things, right? And so determining what values, what our values are, the L, like the love, um, figuring out what those values are and ensuring that those boundaries that we set are in line with our personal values and then communicating and enacting those boundaries. Um, and so in terms of what I've done, what, what happened, and I would be happy, I wanna take the last few minutes um, to share these and to get some input. One of them is a, is a gratitude journal at the end of the day, which I know people have already, people have told me for a long time to do, but I actually started doing it and ending the day with that, instead of like, I haven't done this, I haven't done this, but ending up with this is all that I did and this was enough has been really useful for me. The, this kind of mantra of if it's not a hell yes, it's a no, is really difficult for me because I love people pleasing and I'm working on this, but here I am. Webs of accountability, many of whom are in this room with us right now. So telling people out loud, like, I really don't want to do this. So that when they ask me about it in a week, hey, are you going to do that thing? I have to, right, having someone to keep me accountable for the things that I do and don't um, want to do to help me out with that. Um, recognizing my own agency in a given situation. So recognizing what I can do and that uh, my surroundings are to some extent like the um, outcomes of my own decisions. 
and reflecting on values, especially around should. So when I'm thinking to myself, I should be doing this, I should, in, in questioning who values those are that are influencing um, those desires. Role playing to say no or preparing responses. So this has been working. I've been working with my therapist of like, okay, Sam, I'm your I'm your chair, and I wanted you to work on this project. Tell me no, and I'm like, no, I don't want to. And so role playing has been helpful for me, although it's really awkward, but it's fun, and I would be happy to play with anyone. Um, accepting good enough. So accepting that I am not going to be a, a superstar scholar and that is fine because that's not in the line with my values um and then something that is hidden beneath my zoom thing which we'll never know um so there we go there we have it i wonder if we have any questions or think about things that we can do particularly as our institutions to agitate change but we only have two minutes so um, it's hard there's to a ask. there's a comment in the chat sam from spencer whitehead um, this person wrote, one thing I've learned is changing the word should to could, i.e. I could grade right now versus I should grade right now was something that they contributed. Yes. Um, and, and then Sean Camp also shared a short little book. I recognize that as relative. Short little book to whom? Just kidding, <laughs> Sean. A short little book that talks about um, trauma-informed self-care for educators, which is really important. Those Sean, I, knew, I knew I should have just asked you to cope with that. I was like, get some social workers in here to just tell people how to self-care. <laughs> uh, perfect. Well, I'll just end with that, which is that, I don't know, it just seems to me the take home is self-care is a little more complicated than just like a, always like the bubble bath or the yoga. It, it, took a, it takes, I think, a lot of um, self-recognition and reflection about what we are, what's important for us and what, how we can achieve that, right? Um, and it's often, for me, it's often trying to figure out the time of saying no and putting boundaries on what I dedicate myself to. With that. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today. That's, that's a wrap, my friends. You did it. Now on to department.